This haptic feedback stuff is awesome. In case you're completely confused right now, let me tell you that this haptic feedback system here can create all sorts of different vibration patterns to interact with a user. And I would love to use this feature for an upcoming project. Only problem is that this development board costs around 240 euro, which is way too expensive for any kind of project. However, the main piezo haptic driver I see, the BOS1921, can be bought for around 4 euro, which definitely makes it more attractive for projects. So of course, I wanted to create a small breakout board for it. But while doing research, I realized that this is the first IC I ever worked with that features i3C, which is the successor to the I2C communication protocol that you are most likely familiar with because tons of sensors and boards utilize it. I2C is, in my opinion, pretty much a golden standard when it comes to communication between ICs meaning its successor is a pretty big deal. So in this video, let's create a hopefully functional breakout board in order to investigate i3C and find out whether we should all use that or instead stick with i2C. Let's get started. This video is sponsored by Keysight's HD3 Oscilloscope, which due to Keysight's designed 14-bit ADC lets you see waveforms like never before. Combine that with a large selection of serial bus protocols, software applications and specialized probes and you got yourself an oscilloscope that can be used for almost everything when it comes to working with electronics. If that piqued your interest, then make sure to watch the HD3 virtual event right now using the link below to find out even more. Now when it comes to creating a breakout board around an IC, then we should always check the datasheet first, where I found this typical application schematic as well as this PCB layout example. But since I pretty much only wanted to copy the design from the dev board, I also checked this datasheet and was super happy to find the fitting schematic, PCB design and most importantly all utilized components with part numbers that we can easily find on the internet. Amazing! So the next step was creating my own schematic, which maybe took me around half an hour. Once that was done, I converted the schematic into a PCB and started designing, which Definitely, it took me a couple of hours. What was important was to get all the capacitors and the one coil as close as possible to the main IC. And in order to achieve that, I went with a four layer design. This way, I can use the top and bottom layer for routing my signals using quite a few vias and then stitch the supply voltage and ground layer to the corresponding pins by simply placing a VR next to them and jumping to the inner layers. Not really hard to do, but it takes a bit of time until you get a decent result, which mine hopefully looks like. So next, I ordered the PCBs, waited for a week and then ripped open its package to finally get my hands on my maybe functional breakout boards. To find that out, I next spread solder paste onto four of them that I will assemble for testing. And as you would assume, the next and almost last step was simply placing all components very carefully on their designated spots and ultimately let them reflow solder with my mini hot plate here. And after adding mail headers to all boards along with some terminals, I was pretty happy with the end results. And in order to test them, I firstly wanted to apply 5 volts, which the main IC can easily take. The only problem now was that apparently no board was working correctly. As you can see, we got a way too big current flow, which would increase even more if I would not limit it. 
In such situations, it is nice to have a thermal camera around to see exactly what component is heating up. And apparently it is this 100 microfarad capacitor here. The reason is pretty stupid to be honest, because I thought this line would represent the negative terminal, just like with an electrolytic capacitor. But as it turns out, in this case the line stands for the positive pole, meaning that after flipping this capacitor on old boards, they all powered up nicely. And for the final tests, I simply connected power and the SDA and SCL pin to the expensive development board, hooked up a piezo actuator to the outputs and used the given dev board software to play back some waveforms, which as you can hear, works perfectly fine, meaning we now got some cheaper haptic feedback driver boards that we can use for projects. Awesome! The last question now is whether we should use i3c or i2c to talk to them, because they are compatible with both. To answer that, I read through the 99 pages of the IC's datasheet, because there they very lovely explained the main differences between the two protocols. So first off, there is timing, meaning that with I2C we can use a max frequency of 1 MHz, while with I3C it is 12.5 MHz. That is a huge difference and allows for way higher data transfer rate. The reason why this is possible is because I3C departs from the open collector design of I2C. There you always got pull up resistors, obviously pulling your lines up to the supply voltage, which represents a binary one. And when the open collector stage turns on, this voltage gets pulled to ground, which represents our binary zero. Now of course, you could keep this pull up resistor value low in order to make the rise and fall time shorter and thus the edges sharper, which is pretty obvious to spot when we switch to higher resistance pull up resistors. But then again, smaller resistors also waste more power when the same voltage gets applied, making them less efficient to use. So to get rid of both problems, I3C uses push and pull drivers which makes it possible to very quickly switch states while wasting very little power. But in general, the I2C and I3C data transfer still looks pretty similar, starting with the target address, the read or write bit, the acknowledge bit, register address and ultimately all the data. And if you're completely confused right now, then I highly recommend checking out my I2C video where you can get more details. But anyway, there is a small difference by using a transition bit, which I will not go into detail here, because way more important is that I3C can use dynamic addressing for the targets. That means it gives out addresses to all targets while initializing things, which definitely solves the problem of I2C in which addresses were oftentimes defined by hardware resistors and thus if you use more of them, there can be collisions. Another awesome feature is the support of so called common command codes or CCC, which lets you quickly pull off some important commands like resetting the dynamic address or setting a new one. And the last two important changes of I3C are actually not supported by the BOS1921, which is the hot join feature and the in-band interrupt feature. The first one is super easy to demonstrate with my simple I2C setup from before. As you can see here, we get lots of data from the sensor, which are basically distance values. If we would remove it and plug it back in, then nothing works at all. We first have to reset the microcontroller so that initialization can start again and data transfer gets once again established. With I3C however, we can, like the name implies, hot join the bus without having to restart and initialize everything. 
And the last feature of in-band interrupts gets interesting as soon as you got sensors that obviously trigger an interrupt. Because in order for the main controller to quickly catch that, you so far always needed an extra pin. And needless to say, that can get quickly out of hand when you work with many sensors. My breakout board for example has such an extra interrupt pin, which as you can see here, triggers and thus pulls low as soon as I press the piezo actuator. This interrupt immediately tells the microcontroller to play back a waveform and thus turn my actuator into kind of a push button. So with in-band interrupts we can get rid of this extra pin and quickly communicate the interrupt through the data stream. And with that being said, these were the big advantages of i3C, which sounds amazing, but it also makes this protocol quite a bit more complicated. You see, everyone in my comment section says to just bitbang i2c. It is super simple. But I think with i3C that is not easily possible anymore. Meaning we need peripherals in microcontrollers to make that communication happen. And the list of those is currently very short. However, I actually got my hands on a suitable microcontroller. And at the moment I'm trying to figure things out and make it all work. But I'm already pretty sure that I2C is sufficient for such a haptic driver. Because even the original dev board is using that. So only time will tell when and how I3C will catch on. And if it ever does, then you are now already a bit familiar with it. As always, thanks for watching and I hope you learned something new. If so, don't forget to like, share, subscribe and hit the notification bell. Stay creative and I will see you next time.